Good morning, welcome back to SHH Live, to the auditorium of the Salon, where during the week we meet the people and the ideas of Hot Orlogy. And this morning we're going to start uh, with uh, 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 a conversation with the CEO of Audemars Piguet, François-Henri Benamias. Welcome. Good morning. Morning. So, François. At the salon here, people go around trying to sneak a peek at the wrist of everybody else to see what watch they're wearing. Mm -hmm. Show me the watch you're wearing <coughs> and tell me about it. So the watch I'm wearing is actually the watch we launched Saturday evening in Le Brasseux and Sunday here at the SI Church. It's called Code 1159. It's our new collection. Seven years in the work, first with the movement, then with the casing. and. Um, I could say that today, you have to imagine 1,600 employees of Audemars Piguet, okay, being everywhere, try to listening to see what, what are the reactions from people. It's a full collection, 13 watches. 13 references, six different calibers, out of which three are completely new. A brand new automatic movement, a brand new chronograph movement, and a brand new flying tourbillon automatic movement. So that was, uh, logistically speaking, pretty substantial. Let's unpack a little bit uh, the thing. First of all, the, the name, Code 1159. Why? Yes. So when we, when we had the first idea of the casing, we launched a contest in the company. We wanted this to be a global project. So we asked every single one of the employees to come up with ideas of what the name could be like. And we got names with Greek origins, Roman origins, Italian origins, Japanese origins, Chinese origins, and nothing was making the cut. So at one point we say, it's, it doesn't work this way. So how do the young generation speak to each other today? Smaller words, the emojis, and say they speak in code. So code kind of look at, okay, we have something, but code is too generic. Because if you use code alone, it's it's impossible to protect. So we said, but 1159, we put 1159 because somebody came up with the idea that it's 1159 p.m. and it's a last minute before a new day. And everybody in their life, they have this minute, and sometimes multiple times. It could be a birth, a wedding, a job, death, anything. But there is always that last minute before a new day. And since we hopefully want to write a new chapter in the book of Audemars Piguet, Code 1159 came. Now, one thing that I have to add, through the course of studying the name, because then we had to give a meaning to code, and that helped us reassessing the entire genetic code of the company. Hence, the C for challenge, O for own, D for dare, and E for evolve, which we've used a lot through the teasing period and uh, the launch of the campaign. Uh, it's a very contemporary name indeed. It, no, it's certainly something that can work very well as a, as a hashtag mm -hmm. uh, on social media, for example. So you launched it a couple of days ago. Uh, yesterday, people could touch it and see it here at the Salon. What has been the reaction so far? So the reaction is very simple. For people who have just looked at the watch on screens, we have very mixed feelings. Some people hated it, some people loved it. But when people get a chance to actually physically look at it and start to see details, which is what it's all about, you don't break a code in two seconds, it takes time, then the reactions are very positive. The better news is the younger generation is loving it. So we got a lot of yesterday on the booth, 19 years old, 22 years old, 24 years old, saying, I love the watch and actually I'm gonna bring my dad because I want him to buy one as well. But the, the kid is actually taking over, leading the dad, okay, to say, I want one. I want to see a couple of details in a moment, but uh, this is also a unisex collection. I don't, I, I don't like this you word. Don't like you don't like the word. You don't like the word. You don't like the word, but it's a collection that doesn't make any distinction between men's watches and women's watches. We made the decision not to call the watch a men's watch or a woman's watch. Yeah. Because every time the journalists were, are asking us what is the proportion of sales between men and women. Exactly. And at Audemars Piguet, it's 65-35. Yeah. 
but that doesn't take into consideration the fact that a lot of women are buying men's watches. So it, it doesn't fall in the category. So when we launched the watch, there was a lot of work done on the ergonomy. The watch is 41 millimeter, but it fits like a 39. And whether you have a big wrist like you and I, or small wrist, even the tiniest wrist for women, it fits perfectly. That was the objective. Let's look at a couple of design choices <coughs> you have made. Uh, for example, this one, which is a curved surface. And uh, essentially, if it use the cell phone metaphor, a full screen. There are no borders. Yeah, the inspiration at the beginning, the brief was, look at a phone, a computer, or a TV screen. No frame anymore, which means no bezel on a watch. And the opening is as big as possible. So when we looked at it, we said, but if we don't put any bezel, how are we going to install the glass? How are we going to attach the lugs? So there was already a challenge. And then the glass, we wanted to give the best readability. So it's not a loop at all, but it gives the a sort of 4K or 8K definition. From anywhere you look at the watch, there is not that blurry part that you could see sometimes. So that was a serious work to say, we want to be and to deliver contemporary codes of today's world and have the technique and show the craft and skill of all our, of all our watchmakers and developers. Now, there is another detail, which is this one. Uh, you have kind of uh, kept a little bit of the octagonal shape of the Royal Oak, which is your classic uh, watch. So that was done for two reasons. First of all, because we wanted the watch to be instantly recognizable. So it's a clin d'oeil to what the brand stands for and has had in this collection. But at the same time, it did allow us to show the quality of finishes that we could actually do on a watch. Because the octagon with the brushed and polished, and then you see the under bottom part and top part of the case make the watch pretty difficult to achieve, but easy to show the craft of finishes. We have a factory in, uh, in uh, Gen Geneva where we have 110 people. Only 10 of our guys can actually finish the watch, code 1159. So every day we have to teach them, because we need more people to be able to do it, to actually master the craft of finishing the case. So the launching plan includes training the staff in that, in that sense. Uh, launching a new collection is not something obvious. It doesn't happen every day. And uh, uh, the company is doing pretty well over 1 billion in, in sales last year. Uh, so why now? Why now? Yeah. For several reasons, but the, the biggest reason is Audemars Piguet is 144 years old. And Audemars Piguet has lived 97 years without the right oak and 47 years with. So we were not complete without having and going back to the world of round or classical shapes. And we gave it up. Now, I've been working for the Marpiguet for 25 years, but we came up with classical lines, Jules Audemars, Edouard Piguet. We never made it whole and complete. It never stood the course. So at one point we say, we owe it to ourselves to come up with a collection that's going to be a new part in the, in, in the Audemars Piguet family, because we have the skills, we have the story, we have the le legitimacy, and actually some people are asking for it as well. So this year is your advertising campaign, uh, which comes in different shapes and forms, but uh, are the watches going to be available immediately or soon in the stores? So the 13 references, six calibers, all of which three are new, and we have 700 watches ready to go the first week of February. That was an achievement, logistically speaking. So the first third of all the quantities delivered in 2019 are ready to go February 1st. OK, which is quite exceptional. Usually, we have to wait a, a, a bit of time. Can we mention the price bracket or the price range? Sure, from the automatic to the mini Jupiter Super Sonary. Yeah. So the automatic is at 25,000 Swiss without VAT. I give always prices without VAT because depending on the countries, okay, we it have to adjust. The price, indeed. Okay, the chronograph is 39.5, the perpetual calendar is 69.5, the tourbillon is 129. Just go to the last one. 295. Okay, 
So 25 to 295. There are many backstories and many rumors around the process of creating this collection, and I want to bring up two. Uh, one is uh, a forceful CEO, that would be you, that takes 30 or 40 people, brings them into a room, locks the door, and says, we're not leaving this room until we define at least two new models. And actually, out of it comes a full, co full collection. True or not true? True. Okay. In October 2012, I locked 40 people from our three sites in Switzerland in a room. Uh, I was with them. I locked the door, and I say, we're not going to get out of this room, no bathroom break, no food, until we come up with two new mechanisms, an automatic and an integrated chronograph. We entered the room at 5 PM. But while I was saying that, I'd say, I'm going to be in trouble, because if it lasts too long, and I gave my word. So if it lasts too long, it's going to be an issue. And we left the room at 9.15. So in four hours and 15 minutes, we had two new mechanisms drawn on papers, but then we started to go into development. But true story. And there is another story that goes around uh, about this collection, is that uh, in order to train your people to sell it, you hired former US Navy SEALs, which means really military training. Are you stalking me? No, I'm just researching. OK, so true story as well. We did a convention in, uh, in November in Oman, where we had all our salespeople, sales marketing, everybody actually somehow linked to the, the end consumer. And we wanted to make sure that everybody would know how to explain why, how, what on Code 1159. So we put people in rooms with heavy heat and to have former Navy SEALs asking us to do exercise, mm -hmm. physical exercise, push-ups or, or burpees. And as soon as we would be done, explain the watch. And they were facing us like sir, this. Sir, yes, sir, these kind of things, yes. Uh, not yep, exactly yeah. sir, yes, sir, but what is the name stands for? What is the C stands for? What is the O stands for? What is the watch about? How many parts? How many components? How many this? How many that? And quick, 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 quick. Because in today's world, you have to master the technique to be able to romance it and make it then nice for the, the public. Clearly, you're, you're keeping your uh, reputation as being unconventional even in this. Let's talk a moment about the business. Uh, mm -hmm. The Swiss Autologie is doing, is doing quite well, and so is Omar Piguet. You have amazing figures for 2018. Uh, can you comment on that? Yes, yeah, so we reached in 2018 uh, 1.1 billion in sales. We still 40,000 watches. Mm -hmm. It's our last year at 40,000 watches. Okay. So which means that in 2019, the 2,000 watches from Code are taking quantities away from the Rhyl Oak and the Rhyl Oak Offshore collection yeah. because we're actually increasing millinery as well. So we have great hopes for 19, and then we'll start to increase quantities a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I say, when I say a little bit, it's maybe 42.5 or 43 maximum because we don't have the capacities in terms of building or skilled watchmakers, polishers to do everything at once. Okay, over the last few years, you have, first of all, congratulations. That's almost double the, the, the revenue since six years or seven years. Yes, it is. Uh, so over the past few years, you have been putting in place a strategy that shifts the priority from being a wholesaler to, towards retail, right? Uh, you, have, you have tightened your network of resellers. You have reinforced your own brand stores. Uh, generally trying to get closer to the customer. Can you elaborate on that strategy? So we started seven years ago. I can say that in 2018, Audemars Piguet reached 50% of our sales were done under Audemars Piguet roofs. That's a decision we've made a long time ago that we cannot be in a world where we don't know what the client wants, agrees to, is upset about. It's extremely important to know what's going on. The example I always give is the, when you go to iTunes, you buy your song for 99 cents or 125, iTunes know who you are because they've got your credit card information, your address with intelligence, artificial intelligence. They know if they have your address where you live. If they know where you live, they know how much you pay either for your house, if it's a rent, if you bought it, there are many, many things coming. I don't want to be big brother, but we find out every day mistake we've made because we didn't know what was the reaction on the consumer. So we got to keep pushing. And I, th I think we're going to see even more for an evolution of retail. We've opened houses now. So it's retail which are not in the streets anymore. The best example is the house we have in Hong Kong 
on the 21st floor of a building, which is extremely successful. Now it's bigger, obviously, 350 square meters, and people spend on an average twice as much time that they would spend actually in a store. And that is opening our eyes to what could be next. That could be a step. We'll see where we go with that. So you also opened another concept, launched another concept called uh, the Not Big Air Lounge. Uh, if I understand correctly, that's what one it in is. Okay, so you call them lounges or houses? Houses. Okay, houses. There's one in Milan as well. There is Milano, there is Madrid, there is Munich. We got open London in April, and we've opened New York, but it was not big enough. So we got open New York in uh, June. Okay, so tell us a little bit about what is uh, a Big Air House. It's a place where it's not. A, it's definitely not a store. Uh -huh. It's a place where you will go and see very few watches outside. We can bring them to you, but they are not everywhere in front of you. It's a place where you could organize a baby shower, a birthday, uh, a wedding uh, pre-ceremony. We've had this in Florence, by the way. We, are, we had a, um, a proposal, a wedding proposal, from a couple, obviously. And funny enough, the, the future wife and the future husband had the same idea, actually, to do it, because there is a little terrace on the Ponte Vecchio, Okay, and they proposed each other in the other Marpiquet place. So that was, we want to open this to our clients. They could have a business meeting for, for breakfast or lunch. It's a place where they can actually do pretty much whatever they want. Who, who gets access to these places? Other Marpiquet owners, uh -huh. and also people who want to know more about the brand. It's not a club. It's not, you don't have to show credentials. You don't have to come with a card. It's pretty much open to the public. So since we're talking about you know, physical spaces uh, where, where to meet clients, let's talk a bit about this salon uh, here uh, and, 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 and go to the elephant in the room, which is last September There's announced. There's an elephant in the yes, room. Yes, it's just there. <laughs> uh, and it goes like this. Last September, you announced that uh, Audemars Piguet is not going to come back to SIHH uh, mm -hmm. next year. Uh, it was surprising for many. Uh, can you explain why? Because of all our strategy put in place six years ago, where we basically are going away from wholesale and much more towards end consumers, uh, we say that we have to be more efficient towards launches and communication. So I'm not saying that this applies to every single watch company because we've got different strategies. Some of the most famous brands still go wholesale when we've decided to go retail. So one has nothing to do with the other. But the other thing is, when you think about how we launch product today, last year at the SIHH, we introduced nine to 10 big novelties. Some of them didn't come to the market until September, October, or November. So when you launch in January, it's like a fireworks. By the time the sparkles are gone, the watch is not even there yet. And then the watch comes in October or November, and you have to relaunch. And I do believe that today, we have to be more efficient. So the next, the next objective is, we have the watches in stock, we promote, we deliver. In stock, promote, deliver. Time to market is of the essence, especially for the young generations. We cannot people wait anymore. So it's not a statement about the usefulness of salons and fairs is more in specific alignment with your very aggressive strategy. Absolutely, it has nothing to do and being against because some people say always, oh, no, there's nothing against the SI Church. It has been a fantastic venture for many, many years, but our strategy is bringing us to a place where we have to adjust and adapt. And that's, that, that has not applied to every single other watch company. Are you going to spread your launches across the year as well? Absolutely. Okay. We're going to launch and we're going to launch potentially in many countries at the same time because we also want to launch with the press, but also with the clients. I have a hunch that we're going to see you at SHH next year still, but maybe at your Marc Piguet house downtown rather than, oh. than here at Palais Expo. But that's just my hunch. No, wait, wait, wait. You say what? That we're going to do something during the, the SHH next uh, year? Well, you probably will have a Geneva house at some point, I guess. No. No? Okay. We don't do that. <laughs> okay. We let others do this. We don't. Uh, so, Corto de, Corto de your Marc Piguet business is still uh, the, royal, the royal oak. Uh, and I've seen you say in several interviews that the customer for the Royal Oak is getting younger. 
what has been your strategy to attract younger customers? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just random. I don't know. I, I cannot say I don't know. It's a mix of several things. First, you have to adapt with the language. We spoke about it before. If you want to write beautiful sentences that last forever, you're going to have issues. The attention span is a lot shorter. I mean, I've got a 23 years old daughter. She was home for Christmas. She's from the most ADD generation ever. Attention deficit disorder. OK, so we have to adapt to this new world. But the most important thing, they feel that they, they want to belong. So how do you make people belong? By stay true to who you are, not saying BS stories. If you open the curtain, and what's behind the curtain is what's real. If you say, I'm doing X, Y, Z, you open it X, Y, Z, and not something else. And I always say that we are a very serious brand, but we are not taking ourselves seriously. Typical example. I got an email on info europe at audemarpiguet.com, which is on our website. Anybody can write anything they want. And it's written, I want this message to go to Mr. Benamias. Now, the message. Dear Francois, I'm 24 years old. I've been dreaming about a Rhyl Oak since I was 12. I'm now 24. I've started my company when I was 17. I have 150 employees. I just bought myself my first Rhyl Oak. Keep it up doing a good job. The, the kid is 24 years old. Keep it up doing the job you do to protect Audemars Piguet. I love what you do. I love your brand. Love, love, love. Heart, heart. Smiley, smiley, smiley. <laughs> OK? OK. Wait, wait. So I email back, say, send me your phone number. So I call the kid and say, do you know that I could be your dad because I'm 54? He say, sure. I love the fact that you call me Francois. He say, but is it really you? He say, yes, it's me. So what's up? I didn't say, so yes, my name is Francois. I work for the map. He say, what's up? What is business are you in? He's in, from the UK. He's in the high tech uh, business. He said, I'm going to come and see you in London. Really? He say, can I bring my friends? OK, and here you are. There is a connection. Because I picked up the phone and said, now I want to bring my friends. And maybe out of three, four, five of his friends, one more has got to be convinced. That's the way I think to do it. I see. Uh, let me ask you about your views on luxury. Because indeed, what you're trying to do is, seems to be exactly the opposite from the general trend of the industry in the last few years, which is towards massification. And you seem to be moving exactly in the other, other direction. What's your definition of luxury? First of all, luxury has been a world that has been overused and abused for the last 20 years. For me, true luxury is exclusivity. And then you can add crafts, skills, special talents, obviously, and time. And not time because it's a watch world. Time for anything. It takes time to do and to make beautiful objects. Now, the notion of money is pretty much irrelevant. I'm going to give you an example. No matter how much money you have, you can always be touched emotionally by something. It could be a song, not expensive. It could be a movie, not expensive. A Broadway show, it could be a piece of art, a watch, a bag, anything could touch actually the part of your brain when it's an emotion. Emotions are not rational. You cannot put rules behind emotions. And if we trigger emotions in people's brain, and their means can afford the level of emotions, then it works. Many times, people, in the, especially in the luxury world, don't think, oh, I have to put money there on the side, and one day I'm going to buy this. That happens, but not so often. It's much more we are exposed to things, and then we want them. Hopefully, Code 1159 will be that. Three days ago, nobody had seen the watch. Now people see the watch and start to order the watch because it triggered an emotion. That's what it's all about. Uh, I want to talk a minute about your partnerships, particularly in golf and in the arts. The most recent one that was announced is with Montreux Jazz Festival, one of the most important musical events of the year globally, I would say. Uh, where do you see the good link uh, match between Montreux Jazz and Don Marc Piquet? I always go back to craft and skills and talents. We have golf, you need those. Art, it's the, it, 
it's what it is and completely and music everybody lives with music every single day we listen to music every single day so i have to say that we were waiting for this for quite some time because we've been involved with Audemars Piguet with music partnered with some famous people Jay-Z in 2005 Quincy Jones 2007 so it was almost normal to go there and when we heard that there was an opportunity to finally get access to the Montreal Jazz Festival and I met Mathieu Jaton, the CEO, we signed in two seconds. We were already involved with the Montreal Jazz Festival, but on the side, on the side yeah. by actually sponsoring the digitalization of the archives. Yeah. Uh, how do you select your ambassador? You mentioned a couple of them. Uh, what, what kind of characteristics do you look for in the people you choose to be the right ambassadors for Audemars Piguet? They have to be real. They have to be real. I mean, it's, they pass interviews, I swear to you. <laughs> I, they pass interviews. I would have loved to see an interview with Jay-Z. Yeah. Sure, you could, because actually we became friends in 2001. Uh -huh. And at that time, it was not Jay alone. It was with two other guys, Biggs and Damon Dash. And I was going to the studios at night and listening to the recording sessions and everything. And on the first day we met in 2001, he said, I want to make a special limited edition. I say, sure, that's going to fly. Okay. But, but they pass interviews in a sense, I want to make sure that when they will meet our clients, there will be a connection. And our clients will know that it's real. With our golfers, with the artists we, we partnered with, it's authentic. It's not, oh, we pay you X amount of money and you have to say that Audemars Piguet is the best watch in the world. 95% of our ambassadors were Audemars Piguet wearers before we signed them. Jay, in 2001, had 14 AP watches. So it was not starting from nowhere. And what we see here, we saw Bruno Mars on the 31st of December offering Audemars Piguet watches to his crew. They were not given, to make it very clear, he bought them, okay, because we got to meet together. We spent three hours together in, uh, in December when he came in Paris for a concert. There was a connection, and he says, that's what I want to do now. Last year, we had a conversation, you and I here, and we closed it talking, talking, trying to talk about the Old Mark Piguet Museum. I asked you about it, and you said, in 2019. So we are in 2019, and I guess we can say something more about we the can plans say that for the Old Mark because I even have a picture of it. Okay. I mean, I have a picture of what it's supposed to be. So this is, this is what you can see now. Mm -hmm. Actually, we launched Code 1159 Saturday evening in the museum, which is still a construction site. Yes. So I was giving an interview on Monday. On Monday, it was a construction site. Wires everywhere, people with drills, everything. It was messy. Four days later, it looked like a castle. We had 125 guests, so we opened and we launched Code 1159 in the museum. The museum will be actually finished by October, November 2019. So we'll do a soft opening, and the official opening will be early 2020. And uh, on the other side of the manufacturer, there is also a plan for hotel, which is that zigzagging structure there. Yes, this is, uh, they took inspiration from my brain. Yes, zigzagging, zigzag. absolutely, <laughs> yes. Uh, it's designed by Bjarke Ingels, by the way, uh, the star same architect. Danish architect. Yeah. yeah, the same architect that designed the hotel. Yeah. So it's a sp spiral, actually, on the, on the museum design, and the, what you call the zigzag yeah. on, the, on the hotel. It's 50 rooms. It will be open in 2020, uh -huh. I would say September, October. Uh -huh. uh, obviously, we want to bring more and more and more clients to come to the Valais de Joux and see what it is. But also, people would have nothing to do with the watch world because it's not a, a hotel for just the watchmakers. And uh, hopefully, we're going to see more people coming to this beautiful Valais de Joux. So early 2020, the museum, late 2020, the hotel. The hotel. And okay. then something else. And then something else, uh, which probably is a spaceship, which leads, me, <laughs> which leads me to the last question because I've encountered over and over and over when reading interviews by you or reading about you, uh, the fact that there is a, a small, discreet, but very wise movie character that is your main inspiration. Yes. And uh, it is, if the picture comes, this guy here. Yes. So tell us about you and him. 
So I fell in love with Yoda when I was young, obviously, for the first Star Wars. And it's only on the second Star Wars where he said, do or do not, there is no try. And that has been the motto of my life, because when you think you got to, when you say I'm going to try, you mean that you accept theoretically that it's not going to work. And I'd rather hear you do or you don't. And if you do and you fail, it's okay, because you're going to learn. But don't tell me you try. Try meaning you've got to do it halfway. And what I love about him is actually very beautiful in his ugliness. Because he's 900 years old, all the codes of ears and eyes and everything is ugly, but it makes him very cute. And he's very short, with the right size is actually this, but he's the ultimate power. That's what I love about him. There is a sign somewhere in your office with that sentence, right? It's on my door. Yeah. And every new employee at Odema Piguet that comes to be introduced to the big boss, I, I point at the door and say, remember this. OK, we remember that. Uh, Francois, thank you for giving us some of your time. Thank you. Good luck with the new watch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, the next session is going to take place at 10 a.m. Geneva time. And we are going to stay with the theme of uh, space uh, because we're going to talk about space exploration and how it inspires innovation in the watch industry uh, with the CEO of uh, RJ, uh, Marco Tedeschi, and uh, astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria. 10 a.m. Geneva time. See you back then. Goodbye.